when people are answering problem questions on tort law, they'll often do the really complicated stuff well, so talking about a duty of care or causation, but when it comes to the end of the essay, they'll often forget to talk about remedies. But actually, this is a really easy way to pick up marks and also demonstrates that you've understood the question fully and understand the consequences that occur once a tort has happened. So in this short video, we're going to have a quick look at the different types of remedies available. When we're thinking about types of remedies in tort law, the most obvious example that springs to mind would be damages, and so that's where we're going to start. On this diagram here, I've listed the different types of damages by the amount that a person would get in return. So if we start with contemptuous damages, where the claimant would get the least amount of money, this is where the court is being contemptuous against the claimant and they're basically saying that okay you do technically have a case but we don't feel that this action should actually have been brought so in the reynolds example times newspaper limited published something that was technically defamatory against reynolds but it was in the public interest to do so and so the court only awarded reynolds uh, damages of one single penny Moving on, in a similar fashion, we have nominal damages and the example here of Watkins and Home Office 2006. Here again, a tort has been committed, but the claimant has not really suffered as a result of it. And so they win the case, but they're not really entitled to much in the way of damages. I think in the Watkins example, they got five pounds. Now, for both contemptuous and nominal damages, it's also important to point out that they can often result in a costs award against the claimant and so it can often cost the claimant more money to bring the case than it does than they would actually make from the compensation itself so the court is really acting in such a way as to discourage these types of cases in the future the most common type of damage would be compensatory damages and i've put the principle there from the latin restitutio in integrum which basically means that we're trying to restore the claimant back to their original position as if the tort had never happened. And this is a really important principle uh, in tort law generally, as well as a key principle when we're thinking about remedies. We're trying to put the claimant back as if the um, accident or the tort had never happened in the first place. And we'll look in the next slides about how we actually work that out. Finally, before we move on, the most types of damages that can be awarded are exemplary or punitive damages. And here the courts are not only wanting to award compensation to the claimant, but they're also wanting to punish the defendant as well. However, the awarding of exemplary or punitive damages is limited to um, a very slim number of examples. Um, and these were listed in Rooks and Barnard 1964. So this can be when a public officer, so a civil servant or the police have acted in an unconstitutional or a completely wrong manner. Secondly, where the defendant, often a private defendant, has acted in such a way to make a profit. And thirdly, where exemplary or punitive damages um, can be awarded under statute law. So those are the three examples that we have. Now, in terms of the actual working out of damages, especially for compensatory damages, um, we can split these into pecuniary and non-pecuniary. Pecuniary just means that it can be quantified or we can work out an actual figure in terms of a financial figure for how much damages should be paid. So to take the top example, loss of earnings is something that you can work out. If you know that you earn um, 500 pounds a week or something, and you're going to lose earnings for six months, then it's easy to work out how much you will lose as a result of this tort. And so because that can be quantified, it's called pecuniary damages. Similarly, medical care is also something that can be worked out. If a person has to go through therapy as a result of the tort that's been committed, then that is something that can be worked out financially. Um, I think it's also important to note at this stage that it's not a, a, a valid defence to say, oh, well, someone could just go on the NHS because that's free. And we'll also look at later about how the NHS themselves can be reimbursed when someone has committed a tort. 
Also, lost years just before we do move on. If a person has suffered a, an accident or a tort and it's reduced their lifespan, then the lost years is also something that can potentially be worked out. And this goes back to the picket case from 1980 I put at the bottom of the slide there. So non-pecuniary damages are a little bit harder to work out for the courts because they can't really be quantified and they can uh, often be thought of in terms of the pain, suffering and lack of immunity. Um, this is something that isn't quantifiable in any sense, but it's still right that a claimant should be compensated if they have suffered pain as a result of the tort. The key case here, I think, is H. Weston, Son and Shepherd from 1964. And this has two principles attached to it. So in the first instance, it confirms the principle in Wise and K, which in my opinion is a little bit harsh. It says that if someone is in a coma as a result of a tort, then they can be expected to have felt um, no pain or no suffering as a result of that because they are in a coma and therefore unconscious. So if you put someone in a coma, then you're not entitled, you don't have to pay them damages for the pain and the suffering that's been caused. However, the second principle from West is that the award should not be reduced on the basis that the claimant will not be able to use the money. So just because someone is in a coma or they've not got very long left to live, um, that's not a reason to reduce the amount of damages that they are actually awarded. So what about paying out? Well, most times people think about paying out in terms of a lump sum. So you just work out a total, say £100,000, and you just pay that to the claimant and then the case is over. But this is not always appropriate. If you think about people who have suffered long-term injuries, um, £100,000 might just be a starting point, but their medical costs may go up over time or there may be things like inflation to consider. And so we have a couple of ways around that. So provisional damages can be awarded and then they can be adjusted at a later date. And we also have structured settlements so that a person is paid a certain amount over a period of time. So say 50 pounds a week for the next however many years. Um, there may also be deductions in the amount that's awarded as well. So a person, uh, if a person becomes entitled to social security as a result of the accident, then the claimant, uh, the defendant, sorry, doesn't have to pay for that. They also don't have to pay for long term occupational sick pay. So if the person is in a job and they've been entitled to sick pay because of the accident, then the defendant doesn't have to pay for that. Now, damages are not the only type of remedy that's available in tort law. And if you are answering a problem question, it's important that you do consider other things such as injunctions as well. And so that's what we're going to do now. There are three main categories of injunction. These are quiatimit, interim and final. And then based on those categories, there are two different types of injunction that the court can award, mandatory and prohibitory. So if we start with queer timid injunctions first, this is where an injunction is awarded before the case is even heard. So it's basically anticipating that the defendant is going to commit a tort in the future. Now, if the tort in question is very serious and there is a high likelihood that the defendant will commit it, then a queer timid injunction may be a valuable way of stopping that person publishing something, for example, that's defamatory or acting in such a way that's going to cause a lot of harm to the claimant in the future. Interim injunctions are for when the case is actually ongoing, and so the court will want to put the claimant and the defendant's situation in stasis, or to sort of stop it progressing any further until a final decision can actually be made. Um, and finally, we come to the final injunction. This is when the case has been heard, a decision has been made, the claimant has won and the result of that is that they want to prevent the defendant from doing something or they want to make the defendant do something to um, restore the claimant to the original position they were in, perhaps before the tort occurred. As I've said, these three categories of injunction can come in different types. And so we have mandatory injunctions, which is where we make the defendant actively do something and also prohibitory injunctions, which is where you're stopping the defendant from doing something. 
Now, injunctions are the favoured remedy of the courts, and so if the claimant wants damages instead, they're going to have to prove that that is actually fair and justifiable in the circumstances. And in order to do that, we actually go back to the 1895 case of Shelfer and City of London Electric Lighting Company. And so where damages in lieu or instead of an injunction um, will be awarded, only where the claimant's right is very small, it's quantifiable in terms of the amount of damages that should be awarded, and the claimant's right is such that granting an injunction would be oppressive to the defendant, and so it's more fair in the circumstances to award a cash settlement. Some more things to think about before we finish. Limitation, and um, remember a case has to be brought within a certain amount of time of the tort actually occurring. And so, for example, if you suffer a personal injury, then you have to bring your case within three years of actually suffering that harm. For non-personal injury, it's extended to six years. And for defamation cases, it's one year from the date of publication. I think one of the important things to remember is that under the Limitation Act 1980, it is possible for the courts to extend this period, um, but only when it is fair to do so. And generally speaking, the courts will keep to that timeline. Um, and so people have to bring that case within those periods that I've listed in the table there below. Some final thoughts. Under the Law Reform Miscellaneous Provisions Act 1934, the claims survive the death of either party. So whether the claimant dies as a result of their injuries or the defendant dies because of um, something that's happened to them, um, the claim still survives. And so the, uh, it can be brought by the relatives, for example, of the uh, dead person, or it can be brought against the relatives of a dead person, um, taking into account their estate. Under the Law Reform Contributory Negligence Act 1945, and this is a really important point, the damages that are awarded to a claimant can be reduced if the claimant was also at fault. So say, for example, there is a car accident and it is 90% the fault of the defendant and 10% the fault of the claimant then the damages that the defendant has to pay out could be reduced by 10% because of the claimant's percentage of the fault for that particular car accident. Finally, the Compensation Recovery Unit is a government organisation and so if someone undergoes treatment under the NHS, say that they have to have an operation or they have to go through therapy, um, then the Compensation Recovery Unit is the government making that money back and so they would claim the money from the defendant in a particular case, saying that this uh, claimant has undergone treatment under the NHS and we've had to pay for that from the public purse. But because you caused the accident or you committed the wrong, it's actually you who should pay for it and not the taxpayer. So those are the key points you need to be aware of when you're thinking about remedies in tort law. And they're certainly worth including at the end of any problem type question that you may get in your talk course. I think it's important to say that you don't need to work out exactly how much a claimant is owed. You don't need to start working out their earnings or how much time they're going to be off work. Um, but you do need to sort of think generally about what type of damages they're going to be getting. And also, would an injunction actually be more appropriate? as a remedy for this particular claimant in their situation. Right, thank you very much for watching. Uh, remember to leave a like if you enjoyed the video, subscribe for more videos in the future, and if you have any questions about what I've said, then leave them in the comment box below, and I'll be sure to get back to you. Thanks for watching, bye.